I always assume I could be wrong. And then what are the what, what's the cost of me being wrong? So so that's another one of those hard questions that people don't like yeah. to think about. You got to assume you could be wrong. And if you are wrong, what are the, what's the cost of being incorrect about that? Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Franklin. And on today's episode, I'm speaking with my friend, Ed Lattimore. Ed is one of my favorite people on the internet. He is a former heavyweight boxer turned internet writer who is prolific on Twitter. He's written multiple books, including about his journey into sobriety. He has a degree in physics. He plays chess. He's truly a Renaissance man. And in this episode, we talk about Ed's recent journey into fatherhood and how becoming a dad this past year has changed some of his perspectives on the world. We talk about Ed's education and how some of the unusual pieces of his high school experience helped him build the life that he's now leading. And we talk about some of the life philosophies that have helped shape who Ed is and what he's become. I had a lot of fun with this conversation, and I hope you enjoy listening. How's life with a kid? It's it's busy, but you don't what people don't tell you. I mean they tell you, but they don't they don't tell you all the stuff. Like everyone everyone focuses on, oh, you're not gonna get any sleep. And that's true. But what they don't tell you is that this person is wholly dependent on you for like everything. And and I mean everything, at least in the first like the first week, man, we had to teach them how to feed. Right. And he's he's learning now because he's neurologically capable of this. But he, they're not neurologically capable of putting themselves to sleep initially when they come out. So you're like responsible for everything. You got to put them to sleep. You can't let them. You, you, you go from always having to hold them and move them around. Then they, they get mobile. And now he's not he's not like walking. He's almost crawling. We have an over under whether he'll be crawling before. We go on our trip to Nashville. We go to Nashville in, in uh, I think three weeks. But he's rolling with intent is what I is what I call it because two weeks ago he was just rolling, and then in the past like four days he'll see something because when you roll you can only really go laterally. He'll see something in front of him, and he'll go, "Let me roll like a Z," and it is really fascinating to watch. So so now you got to watch him. When you put them down, oh, no, no, there's tricks. You know, you, you carve out an area where there's nothing that can kill him and just let him wander around. And that's one of the reasons why we moved. We were living in an apartment. Now we have more space with a living room set up. But it, it's fun. It, it's it's really fun to watch this person develop and learn about the world. So it, it, it's a cool time. It sounds like he's rolling like you tack a sailboat, like going back and forth to go into right. the wind. <laughs> it's just smart stuff, man. And look, it is smart. It, it, it sounds smart because you're like, oh, it's a baby. You can't figure out. I'm like, well, you know, he, in a few months, he'll be saying words from not having an idea what like sound was. And I say that because like his first hour out the wound, every time he sneezed, he would cry because he's like, what the hell is that? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really it's always amazing to me to watch little kids learning to process the world, because I think we kind of forget the raw computational power that's required to make sense of things like crawling and walking and talking. And yet it's kind of like growing plants like you can't make a plant grow when you put a seed down it has to figure it out for itself how to become a plant in the same way with a child like you can't you're not orchestrating how they're learning to walk and talk you're encouraging them but you can't make them do that and yet somehow this little tiny human can figure all of this stuff out on their own (laughs) it's insane and then here's you know to that point or this is your sleep as, as an example so there are people who are like to sleep train it's called like cried out method. You, you, you let them cry. But here's some caveats about this. Uh, one, you can't really, you're not supposed to, and I don't think it would even work before like four months. And why is that? Well, well, we never think about this, but think about what you have to do to fall asleep. And then it's automatic. Now you've been doing it for over 20 years and you don't you have no idea how you do it. 
But but think about it. You without first you gotta build up sleep pressure, right? You gotta get tired. And you can do it with a minimal amount of sleep pressure right now. You but but babies need a lot of it. On top, and that's just like what'll naturally make you sleep when your adenosine, you know, builds up and you're like, boom, it's time to go to sleep. But it's the other thing that happens. You have to take your mind off of the outside world and like put it someplace. It, 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 I actually think it's probably a manipulation of your parasympathetic nervous system, the one that controls the automatic functions, uh, which is why you, when your brain waves change when you're trying to go to sleep. Okay. And you got to be able to do that. And then focus in, lower your breathing, relax, and just let the magic happen and, and know that eventually uh, a light will go off and then it, it'll come back on a few hours later. And, and you just trust in knowing that process. And that is a lot of pure mental stuff. Well, they don't have it. So so I used to get confused about this concept of being overtired, which is what happens to, to infants. And I'm like, man, we'll just go to sleep, bro, like you're tired. Well, they, they can't. Mm -hmm. And that's why after the neurologically, they don't have the capability because uh, what's the big thing that I that, that I learned is that because of the way humans are like designed or whatever, we're actually born like three months early. We, we're supposed to spend more time in the, in the wound neurologically developing, but that would be we'd be too big to pass the birth canal so we come out. So those first three months, they call it like the fourth trimester. Mm hmm. And after that, then it is safe because then they have the, the brain capacity to, at the very least, it won't do damage. Now, what, what is your kid up to the point where it can do that? You know, it depends. You know, last night she had to go out for dinner and it was just me. And, and I am, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm definitely tougher than her in this regard. He was crying. I ain't going there to rescue him. I'm like, look, man, I know you can do it. Because I've heard <laughs> you do it before. Because we, we, we do do it now yeah. because he'll be six months this week. Um, but I let him cry. And it took about 30 minutes. And and there were, there were probably 15 of those where if she was here, she'd have ran in there and been like, get him. I'm like, nah, I know he's fed chains. And we can look at the camera and see he's okay. Nothing fell in the, in the, in the uh, what is that called? The crib with him. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, he put himself to sleep, but he wouldn't have been able to do that. He would have just kept crying a few months ago because he doesn't have the brain to do it. Yeah, it's it's wild to watch how quickly they develop. I love when when my friends have kids and I get to watch the like I get to visit them every couple of weeks or every couple of months and see how quickly they change. It's yes. always amazing <laughs> to me. I feel like it always recenters my level of of just respect and admiration for just how much humans are capable of it's like if a baby can figure this out right it's cool and then not, now we got to deal with well he hasn't he hasn't he has figured out a little cause and effect but mm -hmm. apparently that's going to skyrocket soon and he'll you know they they learn well they, they know that cry equals attention right mm -hmm. so one of the, the like they're crying they're like the yeah, sleep thing there comes a point where it's like cry come get me but when he wakes up and he's well rested and like this morning, he just sat in the playpen, gaggling and playing and laughing and moving around, trying to grab the sound machine that's in there. We have a white noise sound machine. Mm -hmm. It's you know a little handheld. He'll reach over and grab it. So it's, uh, it's fun times. How does having a kid change your perspective? Because I feel like every friend that I've ever had who's had a child has said like the world is just different. Once the baby comes along, uh, is the world different? I I'll say this. Here, here here's the major change. I don't think much else changed because I was already a a very conscious not not just conscientious because it's a uh, there are a few traits and I think I'd already had many of them to a high level. You got to be conscientious. You got to be aware of how what you do affects other people. I'm always talking about that. That that, you know, how you treat somebody is going to have an effect on somebody you'll never meet. Mm -hmm. And all, I was always aware of that. With the kid, it's, it's just an extension. I'm just like, okay, well, I know if I do everything right, people that I'll never meet who will be born years after me, or the shit, they, who aren't even born now are going to have kids, they're going to be set up, uh, at least there's a greater probability they're going to have success in life. So so all of that... Uh, Wait, can you can you expand on that a little bit more before you go any farther? 
when like how you're thinking of you're basically if I understand you correctly, you're saying that if you the how you raise your kid is going to affect people that you haven't even met yet because of yeah. how well he's set up to be successful in life. Well, you know, think of it this way, right? Um, you, you have to think about your actions in terms of how they reverberate based both in space and time. And, and I just don't think most people think this, but this has always been how I thought. I know that if I having good manners, for example, it's just some basic, just saying, you know, please, thank you, ask how somebody's day is to serve me, you're kicking the banner back and forth. That's one interaction. And that interaction can change how they perceive an entire group of people. Let me tell you something. I have I have a friend. This is, well, I haven't talked to her in years. This is in high school. Um, and she said to me, this always stuck out to me. She said, you know, if it wasn't for me and you, I probably would have become racist. Now, it's it's real easy to, to jump on that. But let's take a lesson from that. My everything I do, whether I want it to be or not, it's going, you know, it's going to carry some superficial reflection. Since, you know, you look at me, I'm a black dude and a guy. OK, so how I how I treat people, they're going to they, they get a chance to form an opinion. And because they form that opinion, uh, that's going to form their actions. Now, imagine she ends up in a position of power or there's a friend there's a potential best friend that's black right now. If she had a bad experience with me, she never gives that friend a chance or somebody under her doesn't get a promotion deserved, all kinds of problems. But because I, I, I made a good impression, that changes the entire dynamic. That's how it reverberates, you know, in, in space and time, down the line in the future and people I never meet. So I think about this what, with my kid. And, and remember, uh, people can have a kid that is a net negative. I try to add a net positive. Like like the parents of of uh, Osama bin Laden, man, that's a, that's a net negative on the world. No no doubt about it. A lot of lives lost. Parents of Dahmer. Parents of Manson. Go on. Anybody that this this really messed the world up, they were somebody's you know giggling baby one time. Just like my son is mine. And so you got to think of everything you do now. You know, it's not a guarantee. It's nothing a guarantee. They come up with their own personalities and there's environmental stuff too. But it's really your job, I think, as a parent to, to take care of as much of the environment as you can uh, and set a good example. Well, like I read somewhere that like the only thing that matters for real to parents do is like the zip code they choose to live in. Okay. Do I believe that entirely? No. Is there some truth in that idea? There's a lot of truth in that idea because there's a big difference between being raised where my kid will be raised and being raised where I was raised. Huge difference. And then the people you interact with, the opportunities you get, uh, the families you meet, all that, right? And you can control that. So you got to think about that. That's what I mean when I say that. Why don't you believe the zip code thing? Oh, uh, because I think there's more to it. Uh, the, like the, the statement when I when I heard it, I uh, was like, the, the only two things that really matter that parents can do to op- to, to influence their, their offspring, it was something like their zip code and and like the, any diseases I think they get are, are traits they get genetically. But other than that, like parents don't really have an influence on how the child was raised. And I was just like, oh, who said that? Out, I'll, I'll have to find this, but... But the, the idea was, was a, a greater defense of of nature, which is, or not, yeah, I guess nature. Well, you know, that we come out and we're, we're kind of, a, not necessarily a blank, in fact, not a blank slate. Uh, we come out very much with a personality and there's nothing you can do to really influence that. I don't think that's true. I think there's less we can do than we think, but... I feel like this doesn't hold water unless you're using zip code as a proxy for for environment in general, not just yeah. geographic location, but also the the environment of the home, the people that you're putting your kids well, well, in front well, of. Right. You know, that that's absolutely true. You know, so that's why it holds water. Yeah. Because you can if you look at a zip code, very not very rarely, but but seldom. 
uh, well, one half of a zip code would be like, the, you know, low crime, high income. Yeah. And the other half would be like the hood. Doesn't really work that way. Um, yeah. So what you <laughs> you look at, and if you want to drill it down to something more precise in case it does, like the school district. And, and you know, you're from the my area. And there's a big difference between the Pittsburgh Public School District and the Chartiers Valley, which is where we're at now, or the Upper St. Clair. Different school districts, different resources, different outcomes, yeah. different tax base, different type of people that end up living there. So you get a different type of surrounding, different peers, different people you cross paths with daily. That's a big difference, like huge difference. And you know, think about what you have to do to live in this zip code versus Denver St. Clair zip code versus Wilkinsburg zip code. Uh, those types of people are going to have very different habits in in their home and very different levels of education and very different ideas of conscientiousness and what it takes to succeed. So how much weight would you give the zip code thing? If there's more nuance than what zip code you grow up in, but it is a factor, how important do you think it is? <laughs> well, all things considered equal and they rarely are, but <laughs> let's, let's just say, um, yeah, I, I think, I think it probably uh, uh, by itself, 50, maybe 55 percent, if, if we're going to put a number on it, because because we're just talking about the influences in the home. We're not even talking about the type of people and problems you encounter outside the home. I think about the, the types of bullying that I experienced. And let's let's just assume bullying is everywhere, you know, and this was before cyber. So we'll. we'll somehow discount that because but because we have to but you know i had i fought on a on the school bus a bunch of times one time we're you know blaring down 279 they opened the back emergency hatch and i'm like wow you know kids can fall lots of shootings so the the, the odds of hitting hit by a stray bullet are nuts uh lots of of crime no, no, like resources to come through and kind of help kids. So it that that makes a big difference, you know. If you got a kid that is interested in, maybe here's a great example, great story I, I tell. One of my best friends growing up, we we reconnected recently. But one of my best friends growing up, down to like the week of our birthday. His birthday is the eighth, mine is the fifteenth, so seven days apart. Um, one of the things that happened when is, is I not only did I move away, not to a much better zip code, it was another project, but I went to a very different high school mm -hmm. than he did. And we, we've got a lot of similar personality traits. He decided to use his to become one of the most powerful drug dealers in the city uh, in terms of his leadership and ability to get along with people and, and intelligence at evading situations and and I used Ron and my interest in, in job to go do other things. Uh, now, recently, he's, he's reformed and recovered and, and very remorseful. It's very interesting actually talking to him. But you can see that. We, we see this with, with studies that follow twins. It, it influences your, your environment influences so much that it, to discount it, is to discount it at all is crazy, you know? Everything from the food you have access to to things you, you end up learning. And then it's also a proxy indicator for the type of people your parents are. How much of a difference do you think the school that you went to versus the school that your childhood friend went to made in his life trajectory versus yours? Do you think it was the school or are there other things about your environment? Like if you think you, do you think if you were in the same the same school or the same environment, you both would have been on the same path in one direction or the other? Yeah, oh yeah. For, oh, well, okay. I, I, man, I don't know. I don't think I would ever become a drug dealer. I just... I just You're just going to tweet about it. I had, yeah. I, drug but, but I had, on the internet instead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had way too much of a, of a negative experience with, with drugs in my, in my family and my neighbors. I mean, I guess he did too, where everybody responds differently. Mm -hmm. Um... But but I know I talk. My sister's a really good example of this. My sister went to the feeder school for our neighborhood. I went to the to a school way across town. It took me 
took me an hour to get there and an hour back. So, so for four years, two hours of my day was devoted to just transporting myself to and from school. But my school, because of its reputation and the programs there, attracted people who would, who they, you know, I had several friends say, you know, we chose to go here instead of Central or Oakland Catholic or, or um, what is that, Shadyside Academy and that other one, the all-girls school that is Ellis. And these are like private schools. You know, I had friends. I, I grew up my whole life in the projects and everybody I went to middle school and elementary school with were, were poverty, uh, below the poverty line or like very, or, or low class. I don't think, but now I got friends who are middle and upper middle class, comes with different values, different exposure to things, different attitudes at the home, different structures. So it, 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 it's a little thing that changes my outcome in life tremendously. My sister on the other hand, she stays in the same system, same people. To this day, she doesn't have many friends she made after that. And then, unfortunately, she started to spend a lot of time with me, and she's seeing a different way to think and approach the world uh, and continues to grow and improve, and personality plays a role as well. But but I just, when, when you're around different things, you, you see and experience different things. At the very least, you don't see and experience other things you know and that makes a makes a hell of a difference too i didn't realize that you went to a different school than just your local district for high school what how did that happen okay so the way it was it was set up i don't know how it's set up now but the way it was set up when you were getting ready to go to high school and i guess you could do it for any school it's just when i was coming from elementary to middle i didn't know it yeah Uh, and i say i because it's not like my mom was she had no I don't want to say she had no interest, but but that's probably the best way to say it. She didn't have any interest. I'm the one that said, I want to go to this school. I do not want to go to Olive or where I'm supposed to go. Uh, you, you go down and you, you apply. And I think it's like a lottery system. Oh, so it was like uh, a charter school. Not no, it was still it was still a PPS school, but they, okay. they have a they have a lot of certain Pittsburgh number of slots. Public schools. Yeah, they have okay. um yeah, Pittsburgh Public Schools, but they have certain programs. I was enrolled in the um and then the high tech program where you're a little bit come in and it was like a, a trade program uh, where you learn electronics and stuff like that. And oh, that's okay. how I got it is, is I, I applied for that and got it. So they, they brought me and I got, I was a feeder kid. I got a bus pass issued every month uh, because of my distance from the school. And, and that really, I mean, a watershed moment that, that's probably it's probably like three in my life and that, but that's definitely one of them. Like uh, in terms of, I can't imagine how my life would look had I not done that. Like there are other little things along the way, you know, who knows? Or, or maybe there are other things where, where it was small and then built up to that. But while I went to high school that four years and, and what I got to experience and see and meet uh, and just learn and interact with game changer in terms of what I, I had to learn. I always joke. I say I got to, had to get re-socialized. And it's true. You, you got to, you know, it's, it's things that people don't realize this. And it, it, one of the things why I like, I like Twitter is because I get to, I get to see kind of what, what people have experienced and not experienced. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the, one of the things that really helps me in my communication with people is, is I have been, I, I lived at the bottom and was reared in the middle, and and now I, I have, uh, I just have the ability to move in in and out of different language patterns and understand and read people because it's really it was really important. If I talk the way I talk to school back home, probably going to be a problem. Same same way. In fact, one of the stories I remember is I was, uh, I asked one of the kids one day, I was like, how how many fights you ever been, man? Because street fighting is just normal shit. And they were like, fights? Never been in one of those. And, and, and that was everyone's experience. It was like people didn't fight. In fact, I don't think, and not I don't think, I was not in a in a fight after the age of, of 14 outside of being in like the boxing ring. Once I got that, that's not, that's not what people do. <laughs> but that's a way of life in, in the lower class and you have and and how that affects your learning is tremendous you can't learn shit that's why i was so bad at math when i went to high school can't learn anything. because you were always... so distracted by fighting that you didn't have time to study forget me being distracted the teacher 
teacher was destructive. They were always calling calling up security to escort people out the classroom and things like that. So you guys weren't actually the, the bulk of your class time was not spent on learning because it was spent on mitigating chaos. Oh, absolutely. It's it's one of the reasons why Pittsburgh, why, why, why public schools, uh, in that sense, in the inner city are behind. Yeah. You got to There's a lot of you know. First of all, I I, I think. It's not so fair because whenever you start talking about the public school argument, it's it's really important. You, you got to distinguish because Upper St. Clair, Fox Chapel areas around here, those are public schools just like where I went. They ain't the same thing, though. Uh, <laughs> and can there, you, there are for people who schools. aren't Pittsburghers, can you expound on what that means like from a neighborhood sense? Okay, so Upper St. Clair and Fox Chapel are two of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, I know one of them. Uh, by by zip code uh, neighborhoods in in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. so you got a lot of kids going there who are like you know they're driving BMWs and Escalades. I was actually funny. I was just talking to a guy about this today on Twitter. Like, uh, they, and they they you know kids with cars and everything go to school and everyone's got money. Like money's not an issue here mm-hmm. for whatever comes up compared to you know. Most of the high schools in the city, and no, in fact, forget most, but maybe a notable exception of older nights, which is in a a relatively wealthy neighborhood in Pittsburgh. But those people are sending their kids to, to private school. Uh, most of those the, those resources don't exist, and so you have a different level of engagement, and 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 you have a lack of of a lot of of opportunities. So whatever so people start to yeah public school, but it's a totally different beast. Yeah, it, you know it, it's it's really kind of disingenuous to 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 group them in the same category of public school because this the, and I, and that's one of the things I had to like come to terms with because I'm I'm a I'm as critical as the next person, uh, maybe a little less critical than you, but but of the education system, but but I think part of levying criticism is you have to know what you're criticizing you have to be accurate about that and so for me uh seeing that i'm like these two things are you know it's just like that me you know like these these are not the same picture it's crazy they like like there are private schools that are that, that don't match the public schools of of like really well-off neighborhoods oh yeah it's definitely it's definitely a different beast so when you were going into this wasn't a charter school. Was it a magnet school or what was yeah, the... Yeah, okay. it had a magnet program. And, and you know, one of the cool things about Shimley, and and it, it was a great experiment. And it's a shame that for, for lots of reasons that are beyond the scope of this podcast, the school doesn't exist anymore. But when I was there, you had a you had an incredible confluence. You had this magnet program that brought in a lot of, a lot of tech stuff locally from like CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. You had the International Baccalaureate Program. It was the only IB program in the city. So you had any parents who wanted their kids to be an IB, they sent them there. Uh, because of its its excellence in, in the arts and, the, and the, the way that people felt about it there, uh, the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater sent all of their, their um, I don't know what they're called, when they're just teens, but not... Pre-professional. Up. They they sent them to the school there, and and because you still had the feeder program from from one of the rougher areas of the city of Mag because it was the magnet for the Hill District or that magnet was the feeder school for the Hill District. You had a you had a lot of good good ball players. It's two it's a few guys that went pro uh, NBA and and football was good too. So you you had a lot there that would not normally mix oh and because of the um I, I don't know why it was the only esl program in the city so any kids who came from out of the country they had to go to shinley so it was it was a great mix and that mix really it i don't i don't know if it maybe maybe in a school like new york somewhere but but i got a got an incredible amount out of it and it's you know it was it wasn't great it wasn't perfect but I know I can't imagine my life and my exposure if I had gone somewhere else. That's an amazing amount of exposure to be getting in high school. That's pretty unusual. Um, 
and and so beneficial too, especially because you you said that you were behind in math going into high school. Were you behind? Oh, I was behind school? when I came out too. Oh, that's not <laughs> because you know when you're a kid, you I'm still dealing with my home attitudes and everything, and I had a very fixed mindset. But in terms of where I was ahead, let me let me tell you a story just to illustrate where because I, I how well, things that I was exposed to I would have never been exposed to it, and then how mm-hmm. that shaped shaped my my the brain. I learned about my gift with languages at high school. And I think I'm I think I'm good. I don't think I'm great, um, largely because I haven't really put the time into honing it. But I'm I'm sharp at picking apart patterns and 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 uh, mimicking mimicking sounds and stuff like that. And why? How did I discover this? I was like a lot of kids before it was cool to be an anime. I was I was an OG. I was, you know, any any of the OGs anime who listen to this will remember when you had to like send a money order to some shady company you saw. Uh, in the back of of some of a magazine, of a video game magazine, so people order like ADV films just on VHS, but the terrible dubs who only had like, you know, the the same three actors, the voice actors, right? But in the, in the in the rough days of anime before it became mainstream, and the internet kind of took on the the well, before the internet, shit, <laughs> shit, before, um, uh, and so there was this girl, I don't even remember her name. But she was one of those ESL kids, and her parents were like professors. That's why they were there. And and she took the time. Uh, one one because I just expressed interest. She took the time to teach me the hiragana and katakana system for Japanese. Drew up some pictures, and I just I just drew it, and I I grasped it, and it was great. But I was stuck with this. I just had this this system. And that's like basic. You can't read Japanese if you can't read Hidagana or Katakana. So I said, all right, what's the next step? I wanted to do Japanese. I wanted to do the IB program because all my friends did it. That, so that's why I say I'm, the, I'm the, the victim of positive peer pressure, right? But I couldn't do the IB program because I was a magnet and I didn't have any background in foreign language. You need to do a foreign language to do the IB diploma. And so I said, all right, what are, what are my chances here? I had to jump four levels in a year to get to, to IB1, which you got to be by the 11th grade because IB2 is your senior year and then Japanese and you sit for the exam. I learned probably in one year. Yeah, I mean, not only did I learn in one year, but I took two Japanese classes. I took uh, I took IB2 and something else all at the same time, and I was just absorbing all of this Japanese. And and I have no interest in Japanese whatsoever right now. Um, I might like do it again now that I know so much about learning languages and I've honed out my, my talents, but I would have never been exposed to to that and never figured out that talent if I wasn't wasn't there. One of the things that people talk about a lot with when they're criticizing public schools is what you just described about the the disparity between a you know a rich neighborhood's public school and a poor neighborhood's public school and just how different they are but one of the big concerns that people have when they're talking about something like school choice i don't know how familiar you are with the school yeah. choice movement very familiar um, with the idea okay so because now here's the cool thing about about being a parent there's a whole bunch of shit i gotta have an opinion on now because <laughs> because well, the, you'll start early think you got some time before. yeah <laughs> so the school choice isn't going to affect you for at least a couple more years um but with the school choice movement one of the things that people worry about or one of the talking points that people bring up is like well people in wealthier neighborhoods with more means are going to be more likely to take advantage of this and kids who are stuck in rural schools or poor neighborhoods where they just don't have as much access to stuff are going to struggle because they're not going to be able to take advantage of this, but resources are being pulled out of the public schools. But the story you just told almost sounds to me like an argument for more school choice. Like it sounds like the thing that completely oh. changed your life trajectory was going to a different school. Am I understanding this correctly? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so I have, I have mixed feelings to say the least about what would you just describe? Okay. I want to hear all of them. 
So, uh, on on the, the the negative is just the first thing I thought of because I usually have mostly positive, and, and the way you phrased it made me think about something. Yeah. One of the reasons why my school is good and the other school is good is is so what does price do, right? What is what is what does a, a wealthy zip code or, or a private school do? Well, it, you know, it discriminates. It's like, what are you paying for in first class? You're not, you're not paying for a better seat. I mean, you are kind of. Uh, and you can recline it, but what you're really paying for is you ain't got to deal with shit. Same way with, like, what are you paying for in the Four Seasons? Yeah, better neighbors. Better neighbors, okay? If you take away better neighbors, you probably well, what you're going to do is you're going to um, you're going to bring in problems that don't exist because a lot of those problems start at home. I, I 100 percent believe that that, it, you know, it, you get a bunch of kids from from a rough area and you give the parents a choice. And if the parents are, are, are anything, they're going to they're going to try and put their kid in the best school. And whether the kid goes or not, that's a different mix up. Uh, a different mix, a different question. But but I, I do think one of the potential negatives is that you end up taken away from what makes the school strong. Now, there, there are obviously ways to, to deal with that uh, that most people aren't going to like anyway, but but all makes sense and all the top schools do it. I, you, you have them make sure they test or maintain a certain GPA. That's how it goes. Or do you kick them out? So it's okay. Uh, if you're going to do that, that, that's pretty much how you, you mitigate the negative, now that I'm uh, thinking about it. As far as like the, the positives of school choice, one of the problems with, with the school system, and it doesn't stop at the the lower level, this this continues up in, in the higher education levels as well, uh, paid education, I guess, what is that, secondary? I can't remember, collegiate, uh, mm-hmm. is is there is such a disconnect between cause and effect because no one is held accountable or the way they are held accountable is easily gained. Okay. So uh, everybody's against standardized tests as you know, and whether they should or shouldn't be, that's a whole nuanced argument. Uh, But one of the things standardized tests do is they let you teach. If you know how to test go and look, you just teach them to the test. And you can mask a lot of inefficiencies that way. But even if you don't, you know how hard it is to get a kid fired, teacher fired? Like, they, they got to they, they gotta break the law. Because teachers, you know what teachers aren't fired for? If, if kids keep failing, right, whether they're, they're not doing their job or, or the teacher has the power to just pass them on. It's, it's such a, it's, it's a weird system where there's no penalty for doing poorly and what's the best way to put this? There's no penalty for doing poorly and there's no one to, to track even if you are because you can mm-hmm. you can just pass a kid on or teach to the test, whatever. What school choice would do, uh, assuming parents care, when that's a big if. You got to have parents care because I, I, you know, I know a lot of them don't. Is, is the numbers would start to reflect the schools that could that would stay open. They would start or the the numbers would start to reflect the schools that are doing a good job and the ones that are doing a good job would stay open or 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 not see things but but or, or rather you you, you got to figure out a way to see it. Yeah. But you have to figure out a way to track that otherwise uh school choice kind of becomes moot. And and and, and to me as I talk this out, it's kind of like the free tuition argument. Yeah, but college is still college. Like whether you let them go for free or not is kind of irrelevant. Still, kind of a pointless system. Whether you let what whether you let the kids uh, choose where they want to go or not, it doesn't really change if you don't figure out a way or you don't figure out what to do with the schools that are awful, and you figure out a way to track the ones that are are good mm-hmm. so so without without knowing how they plan to do that you know i think you should be able to send your kid where you want to send your kid i don't like and on top of that look anyone who says that wealthy families are going to take advantage of this they don't know people who are wealthy they don't know people who are even above or who care about their kids and have the means people figure things out they, there's a lot of ways around the system 
I've been watching the school choice happen my whole life for sports where a kid will find a relative or somebody and use their address uh, so they can go to a stronger district with a, with a better football program or something like that. There's, there's so many ways around this that uh, now, do I think that like I don't I don't think you should pay tax if you don't have kids for for school, but if you do pay tax, you should have some say in, in where they go. Since 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 they've decided that the parents aren't the arbiters of what should be taught, then they should at least be able to pick where they go, um, or apply that money to like a private school. But then it becomes government money, and then the government can step in and say, "Here's what you should learn." Which, by the way, is like the real advantage of private school is that they don't take the government's money, so the government can't tell them what to teach. Mm -hmm. And the curriculum is often vastly superior because of that. Oh, for sure. It's it's a, it's a really interesting, interesting kind of... Anything the government touches, man, they fucked up. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and it's not like... And I don't think they mean to. It's just it's just when you, when you disconnect uh, incentive and consequence from action uh, are, are you delayed unnaturally you you, you get you get uh, mismatched results man it's, it's not good and when you introduce large bureaucracies that that diffuse responsibility and slow down the process and the agility to be able to make changes quickly which is also what happens like you divorce public schools from government money, it's still a giant bureaucracy yeah. with layers upon layers of people signing off on things and being responsible for things and having to sign off on changes, which makes it incredibly hard to do anything to improve things even incrementally, yeah. which is part of why I always say, you know, changing public schools is not a great use of energy as far as places you can focus your right. attention goes. Building things that are new is a much more effective way of actually seeing in a meaningful time frame differences and outcomes and, and opportunities for kids because you just move so much faster without the, the dead weight of, of layers upon layers of management, <laughs> like blog bogging down the ability to actually do something. Well, you just can't pivot quickly. Meanwhile, if you mean, yeah, think about the types of people who send their kids to private school. Means and and, and involvement. So when mm -hmm. there's a problem, they mobilize quickly because they can and they want to. Yeah, and so things change, which is why. Look, I mean, obviously not everyone can get a scholarship, but like. Uh, to go to these schools if they can't afford it. But but ultimately, uh, what's the best way to put it? I feel like focusing on school and everything like that in terms of, of education, that that is a very clever distraction. That, you know, school is to education as like police brutality is to, to racism. It's like... It, you think that's the problem when the reality is that, you know, the, the district is just underfunded and it just so happens. Because when you look at the numbers, like more blacks are killed. And I, not to go political, but like I have to talk about these numbers to make my point clear. When you when you look at the numbers, uh, more whites get shot on average, right, than, than black. But it's a lot easier to, you know, highlight this because that makes for a great, great newsletter. Because if you follow the problem, you will realize the issue is that, and I helped a friend get into the academy, so I know the issue is that the standards are lax, and the academy is like, shit, it's not even like, I think it might be three months compared to like some places in Europe where it's like you and, you know, post college and stuff like that, or it's like year or two. Uh, so the, the real issue is on the training. But if you follow the money, you realize that instead they keep you distracted. So if we look at school choice in the same kind of, with the same kind of metaphor, uh, the issue isn't the school. The issue is the kind of people that get fed into a school. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so it comes back to the home because I don't even think you got to have money to have your kids act right. But a two parent no. household, for example, will probably go a long way. Uh, there's no like it's no coincidence. I didn't even understand. I thought a two parent household was just some shit you've seen in the movies. And so I got to uh, so I got to middle school, to high school because I'd never seen it. And my friends 
My, most of my friends didn't even know who their dad was. That has an impact on the quality of the kids in the school. Imagine if you know you take my middle school, which was you know, well, the first school in the city to have metal detectors. It was that rough. But imagine if everybody had two parents at home. For, for, nothing changes, income doesn't change, but now two parents are at home. We know that's the worst. In terms of like when you adjust for income, we know that being raised by a single mom is, is one of, if not the worst thing in terms of adverse outcomes uh, that you can do for a child. So if you did that, I wonder how different it looks. Because now you got kids behaving, or at least more likely to behave, not doing crazy shit, and then that allows real teaching to be done. Teachers are happier, more enthusiastic to work. I mean, maybe sure you get some bad apples, but at the very least, now we know it's bad apples, not, mm -hmm. it's much less likely that it is the, it is the behavior in the environment, or the behavior of the students and the environment created by the students, so. So there's... <laughs> There's a lot of this that's more deeply cultural than just education. And I think it's hard to disentangle the different pieces. Like they all, they're all intertwined. Education yeah. is just a piece of a bigger cultural conversation, but, and it's both upstream and downstream of everything else. Yeah. But what are the biggest things that you think are actually effective for supporting kids growing up in rougher and more like underserved neighborhoods. Like you, you got out and you got to go to a school in a different place and interact with other types of kids. And you said that was a real watershed moment for your whole life. It changed everything, but not every kid necessarily has access to that. And to your point, if every kid is leaving and going to the other school, then all of a sudden that other school is the same as the yeah. school they left because they're bringing their culture with them and having, you know, two parent households makes a big difference, but that's not always something that retroactively yeah. you can change. Like what are the other things that you think make a really big difference in changing the outcomes? Oh, Why are you man. laughing at this question? I'm, I'm, only, I'm only laughing because, <laughs> because I always, always say it took me a while. I, I go back and forth, but, but right now where I've settled on this mm -hmm. is that, I did work, a lot of work, but I'm lucky. And I'm lucky in the sense that how I was designed, I came out with, with this sense of responsibility and control of my life. Like how many 13 year olds are, you know, are picking the school they want to go to? Not many, I'm sure some. Not, do, not many, many, but the results of those kids tends to be disproportionately off the charts compared to everybody else. Like if your kid is telling you they want to go to a different school, that is a huge green flag for parents. Yeah, and then on top of that, you know, another thing that really helped, the, the reason why I figured I'd go to this school is that what, what they did have is some called, they had they called it the gifted program. They tested you when you were in, if you, if you displayed signs like a teacher recommended you, they saw where your IQ was, and if it was above a certain point, they were like, all right, go to the school. I think my, I think it had to be about 115 or something like that. I know I was, you know, or was and 130. But that one day a week, say, I leave my environment, and I go to another environment full of the type of people who have that type of intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they, it, it just... It shows me a different thing potentially, and uh, and I get I get to see more, and that opens things up. Little things, right? So I'm lucky in that sense. You still got to do work, you know. A lot of people drop the ball, but still got to do work. So preface uh, that's why I was laughing is because I was just thinking about the ways that I'm lucky, and I always I'm, I'm always careful to give that respect. But uh, where where you know if if I was if I was a if I had my mind somehow, you could like drop me into the body of a of a single mom uh, or, or a single parent, but it's mostly moms uh, or is disproportionately uh, single moms. I would I would get my kid involved in sports, music, but any anything, any any place where their interest lies. Where I could do it on the cheap, and if and if I can't do it on the cheap, I'll find a cheap interest to get them into the proxy, because what what those things do is, is they impose structure. They they not just structure, but they also get you where you 
to winning and losing and and experiencing what or if it's music then experiencing what what progressive improvement feels like and what it takes to get better and to learn and improve. And I wouldn't let them quit. You can't let them quit because it'll be hard. Uh, but those those things, you know, any any environment you can get them in where there is a real mentorship role and they're learning and improving and becoming better or, or where mentors exist, uh, that that helps. Uh, if, if I could go back and do one thing different in my from my childhood, I mean, it'd be a lot, I guess. But, but my mom was so backwards on so many things. She adamantly fought for me to not be in sports. And and I wish I had done it, not because I'd have been like some great athlete. But when you're involved in sports, you know, and, and you, if you're taking me remotely seriously, you don't have time for other stuff. Uh you get you 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 have motivation to to do a lot of things and to become a better person. You you learn to work well with others. Uh, you learn to listen. You learn to study. You learn to focus. All the things the school is kind of trying to claims to teach. Uh, you, you get from becoming good at something as a kid, especially if that is involved with with other people. Now, you know, obviously, people can. Whether it's uh, they take up like a fight, fighting or music or something like that, but th th there are still benefits. But but team driven activities are activities where you have to learn to work well with others and improve. You know, carry your weight, feel the disappointment when you mess up, that kind of stuff. That does does wonders. That I think I think that's what I would do. What about inspiring a love of learning in kids? Because you have a disproportionate love of learning to most other adults that I've met. Like you're just infinitely curious about things. Where does that come from? Uh well, well I wanna I mean or largely driven from like I'm sure some type of insecurity. Probably like it probably didn't come from a healthy place. But uh but but to that question, let's assume it, it, it came from a healthy place and I had to speculate. Well you you, you want to encourage it. That, that's it. I mean, it's so much. One of the things my, my mom did a lot of things wrong, but some things she got right. Uh, we we always had books around. She liked to read herself, and and it's not. I read a study somewhere. I think this was in Freakonomics. Maybe they were talking about it too. Where one of the one of the predictors for the the academic success of a child is the number of books in their home. It didn't matter what the books were. Didn't even matter if the books were read. This is interesting too, but it's the books. You gotta have books if they have books in the house. And why is that? Because the type of person who let, let's pretend they don't. Well, okay, let's let's focus on if the books are read and used, no matter what they mm -hmm. are. That type of person, for whatever reason, tends to have a, at the very least a respect for for learning, even if they're not actually learning anything. If you you watch your mom, like my mom read a bunch of trashy fiction. Uh, it's not like she was reading nonfiction. But that meant she encouraged us to read. And through that, you discover your own interest. And they and, and you know, we learned how to use the library early because of that. And reading, just the ability to do it. That's why it's like if you ever play the game civilization, like writing is one of the big things your your civilization figures out before it moves forward. That's why the Gutenberg Press was such a big deal. It it made it possible for everyone to read. Not just a few rich people who could, who could handwrite stuff. Okay, so if you want, you want to foster that. But on the other end, let's pretend the books are just a show. Think about the mindset of the person who goes, you know, how I'm gonna show off and stunt the y'all. I'm gonna have a bunch of books around my house, or if they splurge and they buy books, not jewelry, you know, not not fucking cars, it's books. Either way, it's it's a it's a weird, it's an indicator and a, a status symbol. Uh, but it's the kind of status symbol that only only intelligent people would like notice or care about. You know, it's like it's like a Rolex. Like the only people who really know what Rolexes are are the kind of people who can afford Rolexes. And and that is a signal to other people at that level. A Rolex is a basic looking watch. Like, like I mean, you could probably spend a tenth of what you spend on a Rolex and you end up with a pretty decent looking watch. 
But that's not why you buy a Rolex. You buy a Rolex because other people who know quality, they're going to recognize that you have a Rolex. It's like what we were talking about with the, with the money thing um, and what you're paying for. You're not paying for extra amenities after a certain point. You're paying for the company, not just the lack thereof, but the type of people you meet. The type of people you meet at the poolside of the Ritz Carlton is a lot different than the kind of people you meet poolside at the Holiday Inn. It's a different environment. And you, when you look at those kind of signals, that's what books are. Books are one of it's a signal to just other intelligent people. And your kids will likely pick up one or two habits from that. I mean, to this day, like, re- I, I, I love reading. It fostered, it fostered me. You know, I remember... That was like when I knew I did something really bad. My mom would put me on like real punishment. Most of the time it was like prison. I could just do push-ups and read books. But every now and then, not every now and then, like one time and then she decided that was too much. She took my books away. But she took them away because she knew I liked reading. And that was her fault. <laughs> That's my favorite video games growing up were RPGs. Where they were like, how can you play them? They're so boring. I'm like, what do you mean? I can read. There's this great story on the screen. That's how it goes. I definitely think there's something for like, even if you're not reading to your kids excessively and I'm a very big proponent of reading to your kids. Like I was read to all of the time, every day when I was a little kid. And then as I got older and could read to myself, I read every day for yeah. the entirety of my high school or my, of my childhood experience from, you know, kindergarten all the way through high school. But even if you're not reading, but you're around books, there's this implicit, value that's being conveyed to you that the information contained in books is valuable. It's not just that it's a sit, a status symbol either. It's that, you know, you know that what the information that's in these books is useful and you have a concept of what a book is and how it is structured. And so I think there's something like I keep books in my library that I haven't read. I've read quite a few of the books in here, but quite a few of them I haven't too. But there's something about being around them and knowing the general yes. gist of what's in there that makes me think about it, even if I haven't actually read it. And I feel like even that is curiosity inducing to me as an adult and certainly as a child, the possibility of white, what might be in those pages is also valuable in its own right. So it makes sense that kids who are around books but aren't reading them are still getting something and, from and, it. And here's the thing that is like somewhat troublesome, worrisome about the future. As, as more content becomes streamed or put on YouTube or podcasted, I used to go back and forth with people about this, and they don't understand this part. They're the people who are like against me. They're like, oh, you know, why read it when I can just watch a YouTube video on it or listen to the audio book? And I'm like, because that is for all that's passive learning. You don't have to struggle with it. You don't have to grab, you don't have to focus in and do nothing else but absorb that. And that's something that is sorely lacking today. People don't understand how to learn. They don't understand how to read. They never I mean, they they know they they know how to interpret words on a page and what they mean, but they don't know how to think deeply about knowledge. You can you can fool people because look, one constant about the world, and this is like where the future is going, I really think this smart people will continue to, to be at the top. The problem is uh intelligence is or rather who is a smart person is relative. Before you had to be like 135 IQ. That's a smart motherfucker, man. <laughs> now you kind of got to be uh, maybe 120. And that's, that's still above average. But 120, 115, that's, that, that's the realm of being just smart enough to make a good argument this sounds good. And it's only smart people who are smarter and go, uh, there's some problems here and argue back. And they're going to think they're arguing well because 120 is like, like you're moving to the world smarter than most people if you're even looking at how that's distributed normally. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, like, like, for example, you know, you saw a lot of this uh, during, the, during the pandemic on both sides. People who were like 120 saying stuff, and I just go, 
yeah, you're missing something. Or you're arguing like, like I don't. But look, I don't care if I agree or disagree with the person. When I hear a bad argument, I gotta attack it because mm-hmm. because if you don't attack bad arguments, bad arguments survive, and before you know it, you're living in communism. Are <laughs> <laughs> right. But, now, okay. That, that is that, unfortunate how true that is. <laughs> right. Because that, that's the only way that works. But people don't, yeah. people forget the other end of that, if you want to like look at it right versus left, our eh, imperialism. Right. You're, one way or the other, if you don't force people to come up with good ideas, and, that, and that's what we did in this country with our with our founding fathers, that's what checks and balances go. They, it's almost as if they said, well, we can't guarantee smart people are going to get in power, but we can at least make sure they don't get all the power. And so that that's kind of how that goes. Thank goodness for that, right? But it's it's so important to be able to, the power we, we got all on all this, to sit and struggle and grasp thought, grasp things, break them down, be able to explain your thinking. And I think reading does that exceedingly it, it doesn't do it any better. That's the only way, because you have to sit there and focus to read and pull it in and then think about it, and then you have it. Sure, it's faster to watch a video on it or to read a summary if you, if you go that far, but you don't grasp the idea. And so you, you can be tricked. It's like I tell people all the time, look, you got to make sure uh, are they saying mean, median, change in percentage, change in quality? You know, I just had a conversation with someone the other day. Uh, you know, Anna's 39. I went with 39 when, when Henry was born and I was talking about it. And I was like, oh, I wasn't sure because we're older now and I wasn't sure we have kids. And and she, the woman goes, you know, uh, so I had my kid at, at some age and they say after 35, the, the risk of of having defects doubles. Do you know what the risk is initially? And I was like, oh, what is it? And she was like, it's like, it was like a, a, a thousandth of a percentage. Like it wasn't significant, but it's a scary piece of information because if you go back to first principles, you're like, well, why would nature give us the ability and then just have it fall off? You know, most times you weren't living long for, for acute reasons, not chronic. You know, you get your head chopped off yeah. in battle, not because fucking diabetes. It just was, <laughs> you know. Right. But but TLDR, all I had to say, uh, you got to read because it, it, it there's no other way to help you think. And the fact that so many people are are abandoning reading for mm-hmm. watching or listening to something that's a that's a bad sign for the future because people with 120 IQs are going to be smarter than everyone else and they're going to be in power and that's just smart enough to be dumb and not know it. Do you think it cancels itself out the the information access that the internet opens up, which is like the Gutenberg press on steroids in terms of access to information? I can go type in any old manuscript that I could possibly want to read and have it up in my lap on my laptop screen in, screen in seconds. But simultaneously, it's also opening us up to all of this cheap information and easy to access sound bites that make us feel like we're learning when we're really not being challenged. Like, do you see those things? Do you see one or the the other of those things <laughs> winning in terms of of making us smarter or or less smart? Or like how do you see that the the balance? You know, when Mark Twain said uh a lies halfway around the world before the truth gets his shoes on or its shoes tied, so not effect. Mm-hmm. He didn't even know about the internet. And and I say this to say, if if we in a, in a perfect world quad that this access would severely outweigh the the um what the, the lack of concentration, I guess the speed. I couldn't figure out the kind mm-hmm. of best word for that. In a perfect world. We don't live in a perfect world. Not only do we not live in a perfect world, our flaws are particularly uh, have have a particular impact in regards to the access to information. We are we are evolved with with a beneficial uh, bias, loss aversion bias, where we pay attention to things that can hurt us more than can help us. 
because if you have to choose something equal distance from from homeostasis, negative or positive, avoiding the negative is going to have a much bigger outcome on your life than reaping the positive. The example I I always use is like let's pretend you're foraging around uh, prehistoric human, not prehistoric, but like you know pre pre civilized humans, mm-hmm. and and you're walking on your left, you, you you hear some rustling in the bushes, and on your right, uh, there's some there's some some berries, right? Some fresh berries, but you already ate, and you're good. It would be an extra, be a treat. What should you do? Well, if you go check out that bush, and it's 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 something that could kill you because you ain't strong, you know, it's still strong enough, or it's got teeth, you know, a lot of skin. Well, you messed up, right? You, you, so you should avoid that. Meanwhile, if you, if you get those berries, uh, that's not going to really change your day. Going in the bushes is really going to change your day, though. So you want to really avoid that way more than, than seeking that. Or if you see some, you know, drinking some stagnant water versus versus um, drinking good water, like you can't tell the difference, uh, and you're just looking at this pool of water and it's like, is it good or bad? Well, you should just treat it like it's bad because if it's bad, it's going to change you a lot more than if it's good in, in the other direction. Yeah. All right. So, so you know, if it bleeds, it leads is based on that. That odd, old idea, you know, headlines that are crazy. Artic- like like the article, some, some articles have headlines that are so sensationalized, they're effectively inaccurate. They're, they're false. And, and that's where we're at now. People don't, People think because they read a headline that they understand the the gist of the article. And the media companies understand this. So to get their clicks up, you know, I, I did a whole thread on this. There's a the, there's a profit model where they, you don't even have to click on anything. CPM, they can be paid regardless. So then they're, they're, it's beneficial for them to just up views. They don't even have to increase clicks. You don't have to read the article. You just have to click on it. And check out the first paragraph, and you're like, "Yeah, I got it." Boom! Instead of reading through the end, where there's like, "Oh, redaction" or something like that, or correction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I used to, I I don't think it balances out because of our our tendency to to focus on negatives and how easily we're more misled. And and on top of that, uh, you, you get the other issue. Which is, or rather, you get an issue where you get a bunch of people believing something, and and that's, but a simple fact check could could correct their incorrect you, and even if you can't do a fact check, a simple bit of calculation would would correct their misconception, but that takes a lot of energy. That's a lot of harder than re and and when you're just used to having your information just told to you. Why would you ever crunch calculation, read further deeper? Obviously, it popped up first. It must be the answer. And I'm just mm-hmm. like this. It's it's absolute in, insanity, I think. And that's the future. Yeah, like like you know, everybody takes their takes something away from the pandemic, whatever. What I took away from that is I I, I took away how everyone thinks they're an expert on either side. People have a great. People have an incredible ability to ignore any evidence to the contrary of their of their emotional position, and so mm-hmm. of course they're right. They they've ignored any evidence that works to the contrary. Um, one of my favorite arguments to have with people, I love it because because it's it's one of, it's one of those instances where it pays to be. You know, it's the difference between 130 and 120 in the accusations. The yeah. people are talking about, you know, uh, they, they present the data that with the with the uh, case of the vaccine, the the incidence of heart problems raise up. Mm-hmm. And that data is there. Anyone can find it. It's awesome. And then I always ask, because this is how you think in general in physics and stats, I go, well, well do we have the stats on people who who got COVID but didn't get the vaccine and they're, they're myocardial rate. Because without that, you, you you don't know what you're comparing since we know a vaccine right. is based on a virus. And and there's always a gotcha moment because that's a, that's a hard thing to think about. That's a lot harder. Uh, the headline is, the headline can be used and manipulated by either side to make their point. And they do. 
I think we were talking about this. The more extreme you are, the, the lower your IQ is, or something to that effect. And mm-hmm. and it, and it's not clear whether being extreme makes you shut off possibilities, or people who are dumb just kind of tend towards black and white thinking. Uh, we, we are not sure. What we do know is that that media is excellent at taking advantage of this. Excellent. And all it takes is somebody like me to go, well, well, what you're looking at, just run a basic analysis. We need to know the likelihood of you having this if you had this condition but did not do this. And that's that that's fucking stats based count cal- or count based stats. <laughs> thought. So it's almost like if we have a bell if we're talking about a bell curve of either intelligence or um I think just like curiosity levels are also a fair proxy for this. Absolutely. Like, it's how, such how- a good such a strong proxy that uh if you take the the big five experiment or big mm-hmm. five assessment the yeah. that, that openness to experience is the single biggest indicator of how intelligent you'll be. But if you if you if you use either one as as the measure for this, and then you you think okay, like so on average, there's a there's a bell curve, there's extremes on both sides, and then most of us are like some somewhere on this curve in the middle, and the internet almost like extends the extremes on both sides, mm-hmm. like it'll either make you less inclined to think deeply about things because it's just very easy to get the dopamine hit of, well, I read this article and it said such and such, therefore. Yeah. But it also, if you are curious enough to go down the rabbit holes and ask the questions, then it becomes this super lever that allows you to expand your capacity dramatically for consuming information, accessing information, synthesizing information. Yep. So it's like sort of doing both things simultaneously is what it sounds like you're saying. And it was also is my I'll, my my experience. I'll make it I'll say it even more simply. The the same fire that heats your home can burn it down. It it just depends on who's building it. If you got a bunch of inept MFers, I don't know what the level of this podcast is. If you got a bunch of inept MFers, uh who are who are making who are trying to build a fire? They might burn the forest down. They really may mess it up. On the other end, you get a bunch of get a bunch of nuclear engineers. They might mess around and make a power plant, right? Now, now obviously, exaggeration for effect, but the, but the point still stands. There's nothing inherently uh, special about information. You got to look at how it, it's it's filtered and who does the filtering mm-hmm. and distributing. And and now when you say something that a bunch of people feel and they haven't been, not only are they not trained, but they haven't even been forced to confront. Uh, I don't even want to say narrative because that that's just not right. When they, they when they haven't learned how to dissect facts and information, critical reading as they call it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, then they're just going to amplify this voice. Every side gets amplified. That you know, Elon was smart. He knew what he was doing. He he didn't try. Everyone's like, "Why well, you spend all this money on the on the platform with the smallest uh, user base?" I'm like, "Ah, but it's the strongest user base because that's how information is spread." Still, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, it's how information is spread and it's how like that's why people care so much about building a following on Twitter. You have a following on Facebook. It's like cool you can share pictures and events and stuff, <laughs> I guess. But if you have a Twitter following, like you can have a lot of influence on how people think. You, right. And how not just not just the average person thinks, but how the other people who are influencing thought. Which think. Is, you know like the intellectuals are on Twitter. It's the thing that it's it's the most value per user by far of any social media platform. One of the things I've got I've actually gotten crap for, but but it's it's usually you know mid mid IQ people or low. It's like yo, uh, I, I got I got a pretty big reach. Certainly um, mm-hmm. bigger uh, reach that ex- I think exceeds my position in other areas of society. Like I'm not I'm not a I'm not a thought leader. Like I don't, I don't have a PhD or anything like that. You know, so and those two things are are not. Well, uh, they they're kid. They can be mutually exclusive. Yeah, that, that's true, right? I, separated, I, agree. I guess. Uh, but but with that comes this big responsibility, and it's like I was talking about at the beginning that I know that I treat somebody nice, mm-hmm. that I could change the entire outcome. I could treat them like shit. That could be the breaking point, and the next thing you know, we're reading the news that, that they burn their house down or something like that. Uh, so so being aware of how everything I do affects everyone else, that's a big deal. Yeah. And that's not a way a lot of people think. 
So with my platform, I am so careful to keep my opinions out of it. Because, because I always consider, and I think it's a really safe place to be. Some people disagree with me. I, I don't disagree because, you know, that's it's how I work, whatever. <laughs> um, is, is that I always assume I could be wrong. And then what are the what, what's the cost of me being wrong? So so that's another one of those hard questions that people don't like yeah. to think about. You gotta assume you could be wrong, and if you are wrong, what are the, what's the cost of being incorrect about that, right? And if you if you apply that metric to other decisions that you make, other paths that you choose, you 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 come to some surprising conclusions that that mm-hmm. will alter how you live. But I, I just don't think that, you know, but you're right. You have a lot of influence. And when you have that influence, or a lot of people who are capable of influencing one another. And if and, and very few people uh, treat that influence with the respect it deserves, I think. Well, I think it's a fine line, too, to your point about, you know, what if I'm wrong about this? I think, for me at least, I think about the line between you know, I'm probably wrong about a lot of things that I think most of us are. Um, A couple hundred years ago, we thought it was cool to dose people with mercury and put (laughs) leeches on them when they were sick. Like, we're going to look like what we do now will look barbaric to our to our descendants. But at the same time, I think we sort of have this this just assumption that that the world is very black and white often and there are right answers and wrong answers. I think school teaches this too when you're you're given a test and it's like there's it's a multiple choice. There are four options. Three of them are wrong. One of them is right. And the teacher can tell you which is which. Um, But most ideas and thought are much more nuanced than that. And finding the right answer takes many iterations of having conversations and testing your ideas in the real world and saying something that's actually quite ungrounded, but you have to say it in order to get the pushback to find like where it actually does have some, some footing. And so I think there's a line between, or the way I approach it is I think, you know, there's some things are, I want to be careful about what I say. I don't want to state this as like, this is an absolute truth. It's a fact with a capital F and you must like trust this completely because it is truth. But at the same time, I think the the being being willing to think through your ideas out loud, being willing to be wrong, as long as you're open about that, I think yeah. is really important too. And I think that's one of the big powers of the internet when when people understand that that's what's going on. Awesome. So so I think we're saying the same thing because uh, I agree with that. But there's a there's a there's a, a big difference between intentionally thinking out loud and kind of phrasing mm-hmm. it that way you know, and and looking for for ways to sharpen your worldview uh, as opposed to what effectively amounts to uh, an uninformed unsharpened opinion and that's what I try to avoid like in other words my opinions unless asked directly for them, you, you, you know, I mean, if you look at my feed, people go, you tell people, tell people what you think all the time. I'm like, ah, go read what I say. Am I really, am I, <laughs> am I really doing that? Uh, I'm, I'm giving like, you know, advice based on, on, on my experience. And I think it, it's, it's certainly general, but, but I don't think anyone's going to go make a life changing, at least in the negative uh, decision based on anything that I, I do or don't do or say or don't say. All right. Mm-hmm. Like, like, for example, no one has any idea. I, I love using this because this has been just the greatest in our generation natural experiment that we could have ever run. Um, I think the greatest of all time is when we when we decided to outlaw alcohol and, and what well, we learned real fast from that one. But uh, but but no one I, I was careful about this. I mean, no one knows if I, I got a vaccine or not, because. If if I did, and it's a terrible idea, then I sent a bunch of people to the death. If I didn't, and it's a terrible idea, I sent a bunch of people, you know, to the death or whatever. So I so I weigh that out and I go, my opinion on this, no, 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 because you motherfuckers, I know you, you you look up and you see what I say and you decide what to do. We see this all the time yeah. across. Uh, or you use my thoughts and and and. 
how to think about that. Like I, I learned this the hard way one time. I said something about the flu vaccine, and and somebody pointed it out and, and kind of you know mentioned that yeah Yo, you know a lot of people follow you, and and because mm-hmm. of what you because of your education and we know about you you know they're gonna they're gonna take this more seriously than they would if it came from a random talking head. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a really good point. You know, some people relish that power and they they want it. I don't really, I really don't want it. Like I was telling you before the show, man. Like my dream life, I could just make a hundred, or man, or make a million a year, just just uh, creating and, and you know talking about how to learn better. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't, I don't want to have this 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 a platform based on my opinions or anything like that because yeah, because I'm you know. There's um, I don't know if you're familiar with Cernovic. You know, somebody ran up in a pizza shop with a gun based on some some of his opinions, uh, some of his opinions, and and he's you know he's repented or repented. I hate that word because that had that comes with a different connotation. Yes, you're right. Uh, but you know what I mean. You know about that sense. Mm-hmm. But it's one of those things you learn from. You, you figure it out when you have influence, man. You, you don't know some unstable motherfuckers. <laughs> just just just. Nutty, look, I'm, look well, at the end it. of the day, it's it's well, what you're describing is just like the iterative process of you kind of figure it out as you go, which is, I think, one of the biggest things that that we're very ill prepared for when we turn 18. It's like, OK, here is the whole world. It's no one tells you that it's not black and white right. and filled with an answer book. It's it's a thing that you have to iteratively figure out over and over again by trying things and experimenting. And and I really think, you know, to to the to go back to much earlier in our conversation, we were talking about like nature versus nurture and, and environment and all of that, like all of that aside, one of the best things that like you can be equipped with is just being like having an understanding that the that life is very iterative. Yeah. And it's like you just gotta try stuff. You gotta show up. You gotta do what you think is best. You gotta try it. You gotta learn from the mistakes. And then you keep going. You do the same thing again and again and again, Kids. ad infinitum until eventually you're like, okay, I landed somewhere I'm happy with. This seems good. Or you just keep going. Dude, kids um, are kids are so worried about being right and getting it right. And... Well, they have so much pressure since they're since they were in kindergarten to find the right answer. They're yep. punished. Even if they're not literally punished, they're certainly punished socially yep. if they don't get the right answer. And so it's immediately your, your whole sense of self-worth is built around being right versus wrong. And it's so culturally ingrained. Like I grew up homeschooled without right answers to most of the things I was doing <laughs> growing up. And I still had this when I graduated. I was still like very focused on, I need to figure out the right thing or I am going to to feel the social repercussions of right. being dumb or wrong. It's deep. It's 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 it, well, it's it's probably probably somewhere in our evolution. So something maladaptive because right now, you know, you the the person who can fail the fastest can succeed the fastest, and that is not natural for us. You know, I got I got some no. I have friends that like who have. They, 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 they have the money at one point, the job at one point, they got savings up, uh, but they won't they won't take a risk and do something different, even though they're not satisfied with what they're doing. Like they're a gold right. handcuffs type situation? Not even. I have a friend, right? He, um, he, I, I was talking to him about this and I'm like, so so how much you got to say? I, I didn't ask that. I said, based on what I know about you in my whole life. You likely have at least a year's worth of comfortable living expenses saved before you'd even have to worry. So why not go try? He because he was talking, oh, I want to try something new, different job. I'm like, just just quit mm-hmm. your job and figure something out. Try it out. You know, you, you know, worst case at the end of the year, you know, your experience and knowledge, you just don't get another job. And yeah. he, that idea, of course, you want you know, never act on it, but that kind of deal, people go through really, it, it's really ingrained. Really, it's really, really ingrained. Like, <laughs> it's really ingrained. It's really hard. I'm going to pivot this for a second because I have two. I have two other things that I want to ask you. Awesome. Um, the first one is you mentioned way earlier in the call that you were bullied in school 
before you like in elementary school and, and middle school, I assume before you went to your your fancy high school. I never knew that about you. Was that like a, a once in a while thing or was this an oh, ongoing nah, thing man, all the way I through? Used to shit, man, we used to we used to fight a bunch. Kids used to call me Congo, set up like an eight. So I used to get that a lot. In fact, oh in, fact I ran, I... in fact, I ran into somebody probably about a year and a half ago. They hadn't seen me since middle school and they said it. And I, I just ignored the motherfucker. I'm like, you know who I am, motherfucker. You gonna answer? I mean, you know who I am. You gonna answer? Uh, call me. And they were cool. They just, you know, it's where their their head is at when they think. Yeah. Um, but no, nah, it, it's it's a lot of it, man. You 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 um you would you you did deal with it. It's the best mm-hmm. you can do. Well, I mean, well, what else am I gonna do? No. Uh. Yeah, that's. So it was all the way through elementary school and oh, high school. Oh yeah, man. And and did it stop when you went to high school? Yeah, I'm in a different environment. Mm-hmm. Different people that they don't, you know, different values, different things of that nature. Um, one of the things that that I picked up early on is like I wanted to always be exceptional. So that so as a way as a way to shield myself from that, right? Mm-hmm. This is kind of kind of what carries through the day. But yeah, but yeah, uh, it, it's one of those things. Like I would never want. I, I think about this, you know. Now that I got a kid, I'm like, yeah, I, I never want somebody to to do that because because I don't. I don't. I used to think it was necessary to to build resilience, and now I think. What do I think? If everyone stopped doing it, it'd be cool, and you learn how to be. Uh, a resilient, tough individual through other means because because that very mm-hmm. much, I got to find the word for this because I don't have a word for it. But the the cost exceeds the value gain. Any any mental toughness you gain is you know it comes with a whole bunch of other stuff like like anxiety and worry and, and fear. Is mm-hmm. you, you don't know how to be accepted and you can't trust when people give you compliments and. Oh yeah, it's brutal. It, it's 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 just awful, and I would never. I just I just think there are better ways to learn it. For example, you know whether he competes or not, it's irrelevant. He's going yeah. to be in a boxing gym because that teaches you that that, that builds competence, allows you to uh, learn what it's like to be hurt, and is a and boxing is a strong respect culture. You know. You can deal with a lot mm-hmm. of you deal with trash talking, but there's a there's a line about disrespect. You don't cross it, um, and people let you know when you did, and there's a response to it. And so, so mm-hmm. I, I think that that type of culture, for example, is, is really good. But but bullying, no, nah, I would I would never. And I think about some of the bullying my sister experienced at the hands of my of my family members, and, and I never actually talked to her about it until recently, and it just it, it's miserable probably affected some of the decisions you made. So so kids, uh I, I I'm I'm anti bullying, but at the same time I'm like, if somebody come with that nonsense, you let them know you're anti bullying. And that requires a certain mm-hmm. level of competence or you know yeah. with with your with your hands and your personality. So I, I tell Anna all the time, you know, you know, make him a sweet, nice kid, whatever. We're gonna also make sure he's he's strong. To go with a good heart, because yeah. if you're not you're not strong with a good heart, you can't stand up for people. You need to be strong. Yeah, well, the strength is what allows you to have the good heart. Yeah, it's what it's what protects it. I I learned that the hard way too. I got I don't know if I ever told you this, but I got bullied pretty badly when I was a little kid too. And it that stuff sticks with you. It's it's it it you you carry the assumptions that you make about the world when that happens yeah a lot all of the way it. through until you know you suddenly become conscious of them and then you're like wait a second this is not actually reflective of the world at large this is reflective of a specific experience and i just assumed it's how the world worked because i was little but it's also something that you you have to learn how to be the only way you can like the world's going to be that way yeah like, there will always be bullies so the only way that you can can defend against it both for yourself and for the people that you're around is to be strong enough to hold your ground and say, wait a second, that's, that's not nice. You didn't mean that. Or not nice. Or like, like if somebody said to me, like right now, like, like you, you an ugly MF or I would, I look at them and I would just laugh. I'd be like, what? Like, because it, because it's so out of the realm that I built in my mind. I'm just like, 
like it's silly. I, it doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Um, and that's where where you where you want to be uh, when it comes to yeah, that. strong. Not not the the strength balances out the insecurities too that allows us to work in the first place. Um, I also want to ask you about how you think about like educating your kid, which. I know it's still in the very early stages of having a child and thinking about it, but I'm curious, like, you know, if you want to travel the world, you're, you place a high value on learning. You're a very curious person. How, how are you thinking about what, well, either what you want to educate him, how you want to educate him more literally or more generally, like what you want to instill in him as you're educating him? Well, uh, I do world, right? Because very rarely are things ideal, but in an ideal world, unfortunately, <laughs> in an ideal world, um, we're gonna we're gonna watch and see what he shows an interest, preference for, expose him to a lot of things, and see what he takes, and then whatever he he really likes, uh, use that to teach foundations of dedication, learning, practice, all that, right, and then through that continue to strengthen I, I I've always wondered if my bias towards math is because of my education I'm sure there are other systems that help learn this but what I've what I've found is that like you need to have a mind for sorting and parsing information especially today now, like I'm not too worried about him memorizing or learning facts like that you know I want him to understand how to interact with people extremely well. I want him to understand uh, physical health because I think that is an area that we're going to be very far behind. And I need him to understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, I need him to understand, you know, and, and then over, oh, and that's why, okay, now I understand why I place value on, on, the, on the numbers because, you know, you'll be bombarded with facts and I need him to have the emotional discipline to not react and then the intellectual uh, capacity to read and understand what is there. So so a lot of reading, a lot of comprehension, you know, will probably much to our frustration, but I think in the long run worth it, um, promote a home of arguing. I'm not arguing, but if he disagrees, I want to hear his reasoning so I can teach him how to make good arguments and sharpen that reasoning and and as far as like the formal education setup, I, I really want to see because one, one thing that I've become, I don't know why or how I became aware of this, but it's, it's important. I can't teach him everything I think I would like him to know. At the same time, there are things that I'm, because I don't live in the world today in terms of what a kid will face. Um, certainly I do my due diligence for any, any place I think about about sending in or putting in a program, but I want to make sure that that like if he decides he wants a program, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll teach him what he or show him how to grab the information for programming. But if he decides he don't want to do it, whatever, right? Um, mm -hmm. Same with with anything. I just uh, I think, and I, I'm I'm so curious about your homeschooling experience. I think about that. Like the trade-off is that you know we have to continue to to bring in and develop ourselves, so we can be good examples and leaders for for him. So so I'm like, the more I learn, the more I move away from a pure homeschooling model. Nowhere near, you know, here's a school you get enrolled and go. But but I looked at some of the schools like the like this private school in Portugal and it, it looks very close to what I would imagine I want to do, which is like a wide variety of of activities. And you know, he eventually decides where he wants to focus and what he's interested in, and and a lot of big focus on languages and, and reading and understanding. And I and I think like right, they they do a terrible job of teaching, you know, why you read these books or why they or what they hope to accomplish. They very rarely do they do this. But it's to help you learn to think and and formulate mm -hmm. ideas and see a different perspective and stuff like that. So it's all that long answer, but but to to summarize, I want to see what he wants to learn. Initially, push him towards that, and use that to develop other skills that support it. And then when it comes time to to do the whole potential school talk. 
likely, likely some school that works for what we think and what we want, uh, what, what is important to us. I love that. And I'm excited to to keep asking you that question as he gets older and see how your answer to that evolves because it always does. Yeah. I don't think anybody does exactly what they think they're going to do. Like I have opinions now pre-children of what I think I want to do when I have children. I'm sure once I have children, those will change and they probably will change many times between now and then too. And I think at the end of the day, a lot of it is about getting to know your kid. And then discovering what's actually useful yeah. for them, what they, what they actually need, what what's going to set them on fire and make them super excited to go pursue things and learn and chase their passions. But I'm excited to hear how that answer evolves as as he gets older too. Um, this has been really fun, Ed. We could keep going for a oh very yeah, man, long I, I hope, I hope time. there's good content in here. I know we he's talking. No, about this a lot. has been great. I appreciate you taking the time. Not a problem. I appreciate you having me on. Always a pleasure.